Well, now that I've laid out the theory of cultural relativism, hopefully you can see that it strikes as very different from what many people might regard as our ordinary ways of viewing things. For the relativist, whether or not someone is right or wrong is going to be dependent just on what that society says. And for this reason, society can never be wrong, no matter what. Uh, if a society says something, if a culture says something, then that's just what happens to be moral. And if a society says something that is different, well, they just disagree, and that's all there is to it. What I want to do now is look at arguments in favor of cultural relativism. It's one thing to have a view. It's another thing to have good reasons to think that that view is actually correct. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at three arguments. Two of these arguments appear in the writing of Ruth Benedict. The first one, which she lays out in a kind of implicit, not in an explicit form, is the cultural differences argument. She also presents this argument right here, the third one, the argument from tolerance. However, this second argument, what I'm calling the education argument, is one that I hear from people from time to time, and so I'm going to include that in our conversation as well. Of the three arguments listed up here, without question, the one that you hear repeated most often is this argument right here, the very first one, what is called the cultural differences argument. Now, before I tell you what this argument is, I just want to take a quick aside and point something out. It may be strange to some of you to refer to arguments by name. In, in science, a lot of times, you'll probably hear theories referred to by name. You'll hear a theory like the theory of gravity or the theory of relativity. And in philosophy, we refer to theories by name. For instance, cultural relativism is a theory. Uh, moral realism is a theory. But we also, in philosophy, if there's an argument that's a very familiar kind of argument, we'll call that argument for the conclusion by a particular name, or the argument, I should say, for the theory by a particular name. And the reason we do that is it just makes it easier to facilitate discussion. So with that being said, let's turn to and look at the cultural differences argument. And this argument really proceeds from a very, very undeniable starting point. And the starting point is just this. Different cultures have drastically different practices and beliefs. And these include various moral practices and beliefs. Now this week, I've asked you guys to maybe describe some places that you've been, some different cultures that you've seen. Uh, I imagine that many of you have seen things that are wildly different from uh, the way that we live here in the United States. Uh, there are a lot of different things that people believe around the world and a lot of different things that people do. Uh, and when the relativist points to the cultural differences that exist, it's, Im it's important to understand what they're referring to. Now, I want to give you guys some examples of these various cultural beliefs, and I'm going to do that by showing you a quick clip from this movie, Pulp Fiction. I, I want to go ahead and warn you that some of the language in here is a bit vulgar, so you can just skip over it if you don't want to hear it. Uh, but it's a pretty amusing scene. And in this scene, John Travolta is coming back from uh, having lived abroad for a while, and he's explaining to Samuel L. Jackson some of the things that he's seen in his travels abroad. So tell me again about the hash bar. Okay, what you want to know? Yeah, it's just legal there, right? Yeah, it's legal, but it ain't 100% legal. I mean, you just can't walk into a restaurant, roll the joint, and start puffing away. I mean, they want you smoking at home or certain designated places. And those are hash bars. Yeah, it breaks down like this, okay? It's, it's legal to buy it. It's legal to own it. And if you're the proprietor of a hash bar, it's legal to sell it. It's legal to carry it, but but, but that doesn't matter. Just get a load of this, all right? If you get stopped by a cop in Amsterdam, it's illegal for them to search you. I mean, that's the right that cops in Amsterdam don't have. <laughs> oh, man, I'm going. That's all it is to it. I'm fucking going. <laughs> no, baby. You dig it the most. But you know what the funniest thing about Europe is? What? It's a little difference, isn't it? I mean, they got the same shit over there that they got here, but it's just, it's just there, it's a little different. Example. All right, well, you can walk into a movie theater in Amsterdam and buy a beer. And I don't mean just like a little paper cup, I'm talking about a glass of beer. And in Paris, you can buy a beer at McDonald's. And you know what they call a, a, 
A quarter pounder with cheese uh, in Paris. They don't call it a quarter pounder with cheese? I mean, they got the metric system. They don't know what the fuck a quarter pounder is. And what do they call it? They call it a Royale with cheese. Royale with cheese. That's right. What do they call a Big Mac? Big Mac's a Big Mac, but they call it Le Big Mac. Le Big Mac. Le Big Mac. <laughs> <laughs> what do they call a Wobby? I don't know. I didn't go on a burger chain. You know what they put on french fries in Holland instead of ketchup? Mayonnaise. <laughs> I've seen him do it, man. They fucking drown him in this shit. Yeah. All right, so hopefully you were able to get a sense of some of the cultural differences that Travolta observed. Uh, for instance, he talked about how you could buy an, a glass of beer at McDonald's or how in, in Holland they put French, uh, mayonnaise on their French fries. You know, we go around the world, we'll see in Japan, for instance, everyone takes their shoes off when they enter a home. Or we look at the clothing that people wear in different parts of the world. Uh, people do things differently, and there's just no denying that. Now, when the cultural relativist constructs her argument for relativism, when she points to cultural diversity, she's not pointing to these obvious, what we might call superficial differences. Nobody is going to deny that people around the world uh, do things slightly differently. No one is going to deny that they put mayonnaise on their french fries in Holland. No one's going to deny that when you go to Asia, you bow instead of shaking someone's hand. Instead, what the relativist wants to point out, and she, what she argues, is that in addition to these superficial differences, there are also deep moral disagreements across cultures. And what she's going to argue is that these deep moral disagreements exist and it's on the basis of these deep moral disagreements that we can infer that morality is nothing more than an expression of what that culture happens to deem as correct or incorrect. So we need to be very, very careful and clear here. When the relativist makes her case for cultural relativism, and she points to cultural differences, she's not pointing to these obvious superficial kinds of differences. Rather, what she's saying is that at a deep fundamental moral level, People have radically different views. So what are these deep moral disagreements that exist? Well, in the reading that you're going to do for next time, uh, the author, James Rachels, not Ruth Benedict, the one that you did for today, but the reading for next time, he describes a group in what lived many, many years ago, about a thousand years ago or so, in what is present-day India, known as the Kalatians. And the Kalatians would actually eat the bodies of their dead. Uh, this story came passed down to us, and it described how King Darius of Persia, he tried to get the Kalatians to cremate their dead instead of eating them, and they were offended. They thought it was repulsive. They thought it was an ultimate sign of disrespect. Now, this is, not, this is a deep moral disagreement. This is not just something like putting mayonnaise on french fries. This is not something like bowing instead of shaking a hand. Imagine you went to your friend's house, maybe their grandmother had just died, and you went in the house and they were barbecuing up grandmother. You probably wouldn't say, oh yeah, you know, we had an open casket and we you know, set flowers by her and you guys eat her, you know, tomato, tomato. You'd probably run out of the house screaming and call the police. Uh, eating your dead relativists, uh, your dead, sorry, your dead relatives uh, is not something that we would consider appropriate at all. This is an example of a deep kind of moral disagreement. Here's another example. Uh, in Eskimo culture, they practice a number of different beliefs than what we adhere to. For instance, they practice polygamy, the, the practice of having multiple wives. And in fact, in Eskimo society, if you are an honored guest in someone's home, uh, you had the right to have sex with a man's wife. It was considered good hospitality to do that. Now think about what is good hospitality for us in the United States. I don't know, maybe someone setting out fresh towels for you and putting clean sheets on a bed uh, that you're going to sleep in. But I don't think we would consider it good hospitality to share your spouse with a guest. That would be considered really inappropriate. For the Eskimos, that was considered just a part of life. And that was considered, like I said, showing respect to your guests. They also practice in Eskimo society infanticide. And what this means is that if they had a child that they could no longer take care of, they'd leave that child out on the ice to freeze to death. 
Whenever we find out about instances where mothers or fathers have killed their children, people get outraged. This is considered horrible and immoral. You don't kill your own child. There could be few things that are more evil than just that. But for the Eskimos, this was a part of life. They also practice killing the elderly. Uh, when our elderly get old, we try to do everything we can to make their lives more comfortable and to make their lives last as long as it is humanly possible. But for the Eskimos, when someone got too old and they could no longer contribute, they forced them out on the ice so that they also would freeze to death. Now, here are some really deep disagreements between how the Eskimos and Kalatians live versus how we live here in the United States. These examples are not like just putting mayonnaise on french fries or bowing when you greet someone or taking your shoes off to enter a home. I want to give you another example, and this is not from any of the readings. But this comes to us with different ideas about educating the youth. Some of you are probably familiar with ancient Sparta. You may have seen the movie, for instance, The 300. And ancient Sparta was a very warlike civilization. It was a, a city in what is present-day Greece. The movie, actually, The 300, doesn't depict quite how brutal the Spartans were. Like the Eskimos, they too practiced infanticide. And for them, it wasn't just that they couldn't take care of a child that would force them to kill it. Rather, if a child just looked puny or runtish or had a birth defect, they'd leave it out in the, wo in the, in the woods or either throw it off a cliff. Not only that, but they had very, very strict ideas about... Uh, training young men. So for instance, around age seven or eight, the young boys were taken away from their parents and they were raised by the government. And the training for these young boys was very, very excruciating. Uh, around age uh, eight or ten, somewhere in that time period, they would take a handful of young boys and shove them in the woods and tell them to fend for themselves for a week. Now, they weren't sending these young men out with you know, top-of-the-line, north-face camping gear. They were sent out with the clothes on their back. Now, imagine that, a 10-year-old child having to fend for himself for a week in the wilderness. And while these boys were out trying to survive, they would also send older boys around age 16 to roam the forest. And if one of the younger boys was separated or got separated from his pack, the older boys had permission and were obligated to beat this child. So imagine that, 16-year-old boys beating a 10-year-old child because he was separated from the other 10-year-olds. For us, this would be considered abuse. For them, this was good parenting. Another example of how excruciating the training was. Around age 12, there was a ceremony where an altar would be placed at the front of the room, out in front of a room, and then they would place cheese on the altar. And the 12-year-old boys would have to walk to the front and take cheese off of it. Yet, as they walked to the front of the room, boys would stand, 18-year-old uh, boys would stand along the way and beat the 12-year-olds with a whip. And as you can imagine, if you have a handful of 18-year-olds beating a 12-year-old with a whip, some children would die in the process of trying to take cheese off of this table. Again, for us, this would be considered just horrible, uh, torture, abuse. For them, good parenting. And the Spartans' entire life was built around having just the ultimate war machine in ancient Greece. Uh, for us, we think about our servicemen and women. Whenever I've known someone who's been um, deployed and had to go off to fight uh, a combat mission, I would hear their family members tell them things like, just come back safe and unharmed, or just come back alive. But for the ancient Spartans, you were given two options. Either you come back a victor, or you come back dead. The, the phrase they would utter is, come back with your shield or own it. And there was one story where the Spartans had lost a battle and only a handful of men survived. And when they came back, one of the mothers greeted her child in the street or greeted her young son in the street as he was returning from the defeat. And she lifted up her dress and said, what, do you want to crawl back inside of me now? So you can see how the Spartans have very, very different ideas about war, about raising their children, and these are deep moral differences from what we presently believe. In addition to these uh, societies, I want to describe just two more. And the two I'm about to describe are the ones that are talked about in the uh, short article by Ruth Benedict. And earlier I had said that Ruth Benedict, the woman who is the famous anthropologist, describes societies that were built on 
things that would be considered completely backwards and abnormal from our society. But for them, it was the cornerstone of their society. And one of these groups she discussed is this uh, group known as the Melanesians. And as you can see, they existed right here in this chain of islands off of the coast of Australia. Now, what is interesting about the society is that the entire society was built on a lack of distrust and a lack of cooperation with one another. When we think about living in society, you know, sometimes we'll say things like, it takes a village to raise a child. We think we have to cooperate. We have to work with one another. Uh, if someone is completely antisocial, if they're unwilling to cooperate, we consider that to be a problem. However, for them, the basic idea was, you don't trust anybody. Don't work with anybody. Don't help anybody. Don't do anything that could possibly uh, come back to bite you on the behind. Uh, if you cooperated with people, you were considered an idiot. You were considered to be the epitome of crazy. And in fact, the society would have religious ceremonies where they would reinforce the idea that you don't share with one another. Now think about our society. When little kids, for instance, hoard all their toys, we tell them, hey, no, little Johnny, you have to share with other kids. We teach kids to share from a very early age. They, on the other hand, taught their children, don't share, don't work with one another. They were obsessed with this idea that other society, or other members of their society were actually trying to kill them and poison them. And so no one would ever have dinner or, or cooperate with one another because they would think that the other society, or I keep saying other society, but other members of their society were trying to kill them and poison them. And what's really fascinating is there was one person that Ruth Benedict studied who was different from everybody else in the society. He was pleasant. He was generous. He was willing to help others. Uh, he, was, he was outgoing, had a smile on his face. When you hear someone like that, someone who's helpful, who's nice, who's kind, who has a good word to say, we typically think, well, that's the, the very definition of a good person. But they viewed him as the epitome of crazy. They looked at him as being absolutely insane. Uh, they looked at him the way we would look at the village idiot. Uh, they'd say, oh, there goes old crazy Larry always being nice to people, uh, always having a smile on his face, always helping others out. Oh, crazy Larry. Okay, his name wasn't Larry, but you get the point. Uh, and so I mentioned this because we see that, that this um, view or th this moral system that society had was really turned upside down from our society. Uh, what we consider kind, they consider crazy. What we consider, uh, you know, valuable, they consider to be uh, not valuable and, and, in fact, harmful. There's one other group I want to mention that's also described by Ruth Benedict, and this group was the Kwaka Yudal Indians. As you can see, they lived up here in the northwest coastal area between the United States and Canada. They were a group of Native Americans. And what is so interesting about this group is that their ideas of justice were completely backwards from our ideas of justice. Uh, according to the way that we typically think, it is wrong to punish an innocent person for something that they did not do. Uh, in fact, we would typically think that this is one of the things that is uh, most vile, most evil. If you knew someone didn't do something, then you shouldn't punish them for a crime that they didn't commit. However, the Kwaka Yudal had no idea, no notion of tying punishment with a crime. And they believed that any kind of death, uh, whether it was on purpose or accidental, had to be repaid with another death in order to you know, set the scales of justice right. And so there was one story of uh, a chief whose sister and nephew had died in a canoeing accident. And so what the chief did is he went and formed a war party and he, and he searched the area, and he found a man and a, and a handful of kids, and his war party murdered them all. And there was no effort to tie up the killing of the man and the children with his sister's and nephew's death. There was no effort to connect the two at all. They knew that the man and the little kids had not killed his sister and nephew, but they didn't care. For them, someone had to die. And the, the chief and his war party came home, and after they had killed the man and the little kids, they said, we have acted nobly, and we can sleep well tonight, knowing that justice has been done. Similarly, uh, the chief, if his son died, had the right to go up to anybody he wanted in his village and kill them. And he could say to them, my son died today, and now you're going to join him. 
Again, this is a kind of moral difference that's very, very different from our system of justice, our system that punishment should fit the crime and that only the guilty should pay. And based on what we've seen so far, you can see that in addition to these superficial kinds of differences, there are deep disagreements around the world about punishment, about uh, how we raise our children. There are deep disagreements about how we show respect to the dead. And from this, cultural relativists such as Ruth Benedict believe these kinds of disagreements reveal that there are no objective moral values. And we can put their point in the form of the following argument. And this is what the cultural differences argument says. Premise one, different cultures have drastically different moral practices and beliefs, and therefore moral truths are created by each distinct culture, and there are no objective moral truths. Now, the conclusion right here, this is just a statement of cultural relativism. This entire th one and two together, this will be what we call the cultural differences argument. This is cultural the conclusion, number two, is cultural relativism. That's the view that's being defended. And this taken together, this is the cultural differences argument. And it's a pretty powerful argument, and it's convinced a number of people over the years that cultural relativism must be correct. So we just got done talking about the cultural differences argument. And this is the main argument for cultural relativism. It's the one that you most often hear people repeat and is the one that you frequently see people make, both in print and in common conversation. It's by no means the only argument for cultural relativism. In fact, there are a lot of different arguments for cultural relativism. We're not going to be able to look at all of them simply because we don't have the time, but I do want to look at two more important arguments for cultural relativism. And the next argument we're going to look at is what I'm calling the education argument. Now, this argument doesn't appear in either of the readings I've assigned to you, but it's an argument I frequently hear people make in conversation. And it's an argument that's more in the air than it is on print and print anywhere. And so for this reason, it's a little bit hard to pin down the logical structure of it, but I'm going to try to do my best for you. So what is the education argument? Well, the education argument just basically asks you to think about why you have the values that you have. Uh, for instance, take anything that you believe is morally right or morally wrong and ask yourself, well, why exactly do you hold this belief? Say you believe that murder is wrong, or say you believe that it's acceptable to spank children, or say you believe that, it's, uh, that stealing is wrong. Why exactly do you believe this? Is it because maybe you were taught these values growing up? Maybe you went to church, or maybe your parents taught you, or maybe some teacher taught you, or even your friends maybe taught you. Maybe you said something that was inappropriate once, and your friend said, hey, not cool, man, not cool. And that was a form of education. When I say education here, I don't necessarily mean formal training like you receive at school, but any kind of learning that takes place from other people. And again, this could be from parents, from church, from school. It could be from watching public service announcements on television. It could be from your friends or colleagues telling you that certain things are wrong or certain things are acceptable. Now ask yourself this question. What if you'd grown up in a very different society? What if, for instance, you'd grown up in ancient Sparta? Do you think then that your ideas of educating young children would be very, very different? Chances are, it seems like they would. What if you'd grown up in ancient Sparta? Well, then maybe you might, be, you, know, you might believe that it's perfectly acceptable to beat children with whips. If you'd grown up in ancient Sparta, you might believe that it's acceptable to throw unwanted, unwanted babies off of a cliff to kill them. Or what if you'd grown up in ancient Calatia? You might very well eat your deceased relatives in that case and think that it's a sign of respect to eat them. Again, if you'd grown up in any other civilization, chances are you would believe things very, very differently than what you believe right now. And many people have taken this basic insight, the idea that we have our values as a function of where we're brought up, and if we were brought up somewhere else, we might very well embrace a different set of values. And they've taken this kind of insight 
to conclude that morality is nothing more than what our society or our culture teaches us is right or wrong. And from this, we can construct an argument. And I'm going to, like I said, this is something that's more in the air than you ever see people precisely express or, or, or write up. And so it might be a little difficult exactly to get a precise logical structure to the argument. But here's my, the best I can, my reconstruction of it. And the argument goes something like this. Had you been taught a different set of values, then you would likely embrace those values. Therefore, people only have the moral values they do because they were brought up to accept those particular values. And conclusion, therefore, moral truths are created by each distinct culture, and there are no objective moral truths. Now, this, the conclusion of this, number three right here, that's just a statement of cultural relativism. And you can see right here we have an argument uh, where we have actually two uh, arguments functioning to create one main conclusion. Uh, right here, from one to two, we have an argument. Notice that the second premise right here is a conclusion that's reached on the basis of the very first premise. And then on the basis of the second premise, we draw the main conclusion. And the main conclusion is just that cultural relativism is true. Um, cultural relativism, as we said all along, is a combination of two different doctrines. The first is that there are no objective moral truths, and secondly, that moral truths are created or determined by each distinct culture or each different culture. And so the basis of this argument, again, it just all harkens back to the insight that people have the values they do because they were taught them. And, and what it's really trying to show is that people only have the values they do because they were taught them. Why do we think people only have the values they do? Well, we just engage in a little bit of hypothetical reasoning and imagine ourselves in these other types of environments growing up in these other societies. And chances are we probably would embrace a different set of values had we grown up somewhere else. So that's the second argument for cultural relativism. There's one final argument we're going to look at, and this one is a very important argument as well, and it does occur and appear in both of the essays that I've had you read. And the final argument we're going to look at is called the argument from tolerance, or sometimes the ar argument from toleration, or the tolerance argument, or the toleration argument. These are all different ways of communicating the exact same thing. And what this argument rests on is the idea that tolerance and respect of other societies is a good thing. And this seems like a very intuitive thing to think. It's good to be tolerant of other societies. And there seems something wrong and inappropriate about being intolerant of other societies. It seems something wrong about traveling to another society and attempting to force them to do the way, things the way we do it here in the United States. In fact, there have been a lot of harms that have occurred in the past where certain civilizations would go into another one and view that civilization as backwards and, and immoral. And so they would try to change everything about that society. Why? Just because they didn't approve of what that society had done. So we get this basic idea that the tolerance, or we share this idea that tolerance is a good thing, and we shouldn't impose our views on other people against their will. But what some people have argued is that moral realism is a source, or it, it leads to people being intolerant. Why would moral realism lead to people being intolerant? Well, the basic idea here is that a realist thinks that there are absolute moral truths. And if I'm a realist and I think that something is absolutely true, let's suppose that I believe adultery is wrong and I think that's an absolute truth. And then I go to another society like the Eskimos where they would share their wives and I see one man having sex with multiple women. Well, then I think, hey, they're doing it differently than I am. They're doing something that's immoral and wrong. Uh, why? Because there's this absolute moral truth. Adultery is wrong. And if they're doing it differently than what I believe, they must be doing it wrong. And so some people have thought that moral realism leads to this kind of intolerance. If I think someone is acting immorally or unethical, 
And then certainly I have the right to stop them. I have the right to interfere. On the other hand, some have argued that cultural relativism would actually lead to greater tolerance. Why is that? Well, because relativists recognize that all moral systems are on the same playing field. No society's moral beliefs are better or worse than anyone else. And so I don't have the right to go in and tell someone else they're doing things wrong. No more than I have the right to go to uh, Britain or the UK and tell them that they shouldn't drive on the left side of the road. When in Rome, do as the Romans do. Every society is equal and on par. And so for this reason, many people have argued that relativism actually does a better job of promoting, promoting tolerance, whereas realism leads people to be intolerant. And this is precisely what Ruth Benedict said in her article. She said just this, By endorsing cultural relativism, we shall arrive at a more realistic social faith, accepting as grounds of hope and as a new basis for tolerance the, coexi the coexisting and equally valid patterns of life which mankind has created for its itself from the raw materials of existence. And what's important to note about this is she says that we'll find as a basis of tolerance the coexisting and equally valid patterns of life, which we have created from for ourselves. So she's basically saying here that by being a relativist, and again a relativist thinks that we create morality, by being a relativist that'll make us more tolerant of one another. And we can summarize the argument from tolerance in the following way. Premise 1. It is good to be tolerant of other cultures' beliefs. Premise 2. Moral realism leads people to be intolerant of other cultures. Premise 3. Cultural relativism promotes tolerance of other cultures. Conclusion. Therefore, cultural relativism is better than moral realism. And these are the three arguments for cultural relativism. Number one, the cultural differences argument. Number two, the education argument. And finally, the argument from tolerance.